<laughs> oh, somebody just had a treat. <laughs> Hello, BookTube, <laughs> and welcome to your daily penguin. This is our tour through my Penguin Classic wall, uh, book by book and author by author. And uh, today we are dealing with a work of history that Penguin chose to put in their collection. I'm very glad they did. Very glad that uh, this spares me the expedient of getting moldy old hardcovers at the Brattle Bookshop or some charity shop. This is the History of England by Lord Macaulay, uh, which takes us from the ill-fated reign of James II all the way up to William III. Uh, and that was a meteoric bestseller when it came out in 1849. It was a meteoric bestseller. Put Macaulay on the map, he was already famous for a lot of other writings and for a lot of, uh, of public intellectual endeavors, but th this book sold like crazy. It made him. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and it's not because the, the early Victorians were looking for a history of the reign of James II. It's because of something else that's inevitably associated with this author, and that is the concept of Whig history, which we are going to have to talk about if we talk about Lord Macaulay. Uh, because he is widely considered to be one of the foremost proponents of something called Whig history. In fact, in the introduction to this volume, Hugh Trevor Roper... Talk about a quintessential pairing of introducer and book. <laughs> just just quintessential. You're never going to see Hugh Trevor Roper writing a scholarly introduction for Alice Walker's novels. <laughs> Instead, it's, he's a, just the inevitable. It's just inevitable, like, like the sunrise. But if you're going to put together a reprint volume of Lord Macaulay, you're going to get Hugh Trevor Roper to write about it. <laughs> and... Uh, in his introduction to this volume, if I remember correctly, he calls Lord Macaulay the greatest of all Whig historians. So we should probably get that concept out of the way. The idea of the concept behind Whig history and Whig history is that history is an organic process that uh, improves as it goes along. A march of progress, always towards us, <laughs> always towards the present day. That is the Achilles heel of Whig history, and it is uh, the foremost weapon that the enemies of the very idea of Whig history use against it, which is that the culmination is always the author and their moment in time, and that the solipsism of that hardly needs pointing out. That That is hilarious, memeable in the, in the, the parlance of 2020. And... That makes it hard to defend Whig history. <laughs> you're probably you're probably wondering, is he going to defend Whig history? And I, in a way, I partly am going to defend Whig history. Not the worst parts of it, and certainly not the most toxic modern proponents of it. Foremost of which would be Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, a book that I have railed in about on this channel and in print, in which, from the confines of his gated community in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he decides... Uh, massages the data, chiropractors the data, uh, jujitsu's the data, to decide that the world is getting safer and safer and better and better and brighter and brighter, freer and freer, more and more prosperous, less and less poor, less and less violent, and that the reason for that is because people are getting better. Just across the board, people are just improving. And although I have read a lot on that book, I don't remember many critics hauling out the phrase Whig history when talking about it, probably because they were a little put off by Pinker's admittedly impressive academic credentials, and maybe they were a little put off by the charts and graphs that he trots out like centerpieces in a flea circus during that book. Maybe that's why they didn't point out the fact that what Pinker is saying in that book, that incredibly fraudulent book, is that the pinnacle of all history is Stephen Pinker. It's, it's kind of sort of me. I mean, I have my compost and I have my recycling and I I only do local uh, grown produce and cruelty free animal products and whatnot so it's probably inevitable that the Protestant Reformation and the, the Enlightenment and uh, the, even the Quattrocento, even the Italian Renaissance, it's probably likely that they were all bending one historical arc towards me. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know why more critics didn't pounce on that book. You only have to stick your head out the window and look around the world to know that its basic premises aren't true. And there's plenty of data to back that up. If you're going to hang your hat on the fact that there are no more ostentatiously declared world wars fought by men in gigantic handlebar mustaches, you're not doing much for your intellectual credibility. But whether you agree with that book or not, it is a perfect example of what is often characterized and often derided as Whig history, which is that there is a kind of organic progression in history. The history is not just a concatenation of random events or semi-random events, each one of which is locally dependent on each other, but without any larger arc. Instead, Whig history actually does, sotto voce, usually the really bad ones don't, are, are very open about it, but usually it argues that there is an arc, an organic progression in human history. That regardless of wars or the occasional step back, moves towards greater democracy, greater representation, greater enlightenment in the sciences. Uh, and Macaulay believed that. Uh, and Trevor Roper in his introduction, if I remember correctly, again, if I remember correctly, in his introduction, Trevor Roper tries to point out that, that was not a universal thing to believe when Macaulay wrote this book. Uh, and that maybe that was the source of some of its psychic comfort for so many of its readers, was thinking there was a point to all that bloodshed that our grandfathers and great-grandfathers went through, and we are the point. <laughs> Certainly you can see aspects of the Whig ideology in the rule of Queen Victoria, and especially her consort, Prince Albert. Uh, again, you don't have to agree with that philosophy of history. I, I would find it I'd be hard-pressed to believe it myself. <laughs> certainly, certainly some elements of that picture are true. Certainly there have been some changes. There are more people in the world today who can read. For instance, since we're on BookTube, we might as well put that front and center. There are more people on BookTube who have, because of reading, a slightly higher empathy. Readers tend to, as Jason Harrigan of Bioways and Bookland has tended to put it, readers tend to be better people. They're more broad-minded, they're usually more teachable, they're usually more empathetic. If you want to find a large crowd of people who are acting in a sociopathically self-centered way, perhaps, oh, I don't know, not wearing face masks during a national and worldwide viral pandemic, if you find such a large group of people who are all sig-hailing, arms up in the air, all saluting one dear leader, Probably, if you examine that movement throughout history, of course, no names, none of those people in the crowd will read and the dear leader won't read because it, it has effects on people who do it. There's no way around it. If, usually, there's no way around it. Usually, if, if you read adventurously, then you will, it will deepen your empathy. Uh, and there's no way to avoid conceding that kind of a point when it comes to Whig history and the Whig ideology. Same thing with the March of Science, if we want to call it that. Uh, despite the fact that uh, an extremely debauched and decadent, extremely powerful and wealthy world power uh, might have a large and growing percentage of its population that thinks vaccines harm people instead of helping them, that thinks that uh, pandemics are fake, that they are a hoax of, uh, constructed by the media. Uh, despite, na you know, retrograde nations like that, of course, again, naming no names, I could easily be referring to Finn de Sickle Byzantine. Uh, despite that, largely, science has, has gained a toehold in most of the world. Most of, of the world uh, uses science for agriculture or birth control or weather prediction, things that, that generally help a large swath of people. Generally speaking, more people in the world, just as a matter of proportion, take advantage of that kind of progress than did, say, 100 years ago, or 200 years ago, or 300 years ago. And there's a case to be made that it has been increasing that whole time. The, where the Whig ideology oversteps, I think, is in importing any of that to human psychology. Uh, because... Human psychology has not changed at all.
in 150,000 years. <laughs> so it certainly hasn't changed since the Enlightenment. Yes, there are more people in the world, probably, uh, on a, just a, t a statistical level, who can read than at any point in human history. But there are also more slaves in the world in the year 2020 than there's ever been as a portion of the population any time in human history. So there are balances. Just because Steven Pinker doesn't want to see them doesn't mean they're not there. And they act as an absolute caution against Whig history. So, and I wanted to, I, there's a long, I won't go on much longer on this video because I don't think I'm going to convince many of you to read Lord Macaulay. But, but nevertheless, I wanted to get the idea of Whig history out of the way because you can't avoid it when you talk about this author. And once we've gotten it out of the way, believe it or not, I'm going to recommend this author because quite apart from his ideology, quite apart from how he views historiography, he is a brilliant writer. Now, when he wrote this book, thousands and thousands of UK, of British readers already knew that from his poetry and his essays. And they are great. His literary essays, he's one of the foremost proponents of my own profession. Uh, but this history is great too. It's, it is, once you get used to the rhythms of it, the long stately periods of it, it is amazingly invigorating reading. And uh, that makes, is the main reason why I'm grateful that Penguin put it in their line. Because if it is possible for such a thing as history to be outdated, well, then Macaulay's History of England is outdated. No one writes Whig history anymore who isn't going to be written off as a Boris Johnson-esque uh, extreme right-wing buffoon. Mainly because of its solipsistic attitude, which is that all of history is tending towards producing me. <laughs> that, that is, that, it is so hard to write Whig history and avoid that as a, a kind of end product that most people don't do it at all. Uh, nevertheless, I have on this channel many times, specifically referring to Boston writers of a century ago or more, I have many times championed the fact that although histories can be outdated, that doesn't make them not worth reading. They aren't science bulletins. There's style and intelligence. There's wit and phrasing that goes into them. The, the four or five great Boston historians of, of the late 19th century are absolutely worth reading. People writing history at right around the same time that Macaulay was. They're absolutely worth reading. Today, even though the technical research, the archaeology, the documents have all moved past them, they're still very much worth reading, and so is Macaulay. But, to, oh my, <laughs> reading century-old histories, oh my, talk about niche. <laughs> I, I will still recommend it. This is an amazing reading experience. It is, I, I, I believe, on par with reading Gibbon. I wish that uh, the Penguin volume were longer, uh, and I wish that there were Penguin volumes of a lot of the historians that I'm talking about, who, who Beard is gone, Prescott is gone, all of these people are gone, and they shouldn't be. But I'll take what I can get, and I am going to recommend <laughs> Macaulay's History of England. <laughs> Uh, not right away, of course, it's not pressing, uh, even in uh, such an informal thing as your Daily Penguin. There are still grades, right? If you haven't read Wuthering Heights, then you shouldn't be bothering with the History of England. If you haven't read The Three Musketeers, then you shouldn't be bothering with the History of England. If you haven't read Black Lamb and Grey Falcon, for instance, you might want to block off a, a chunk of time and read that instead of blocking off a chunk of time and reading this. But... If it's on your radar, if you if it seems like maybe it's your kind of thing, especially if you're interested in the period, an amazingly formative period in English history, then I do recommend the, the History of England by Thomas Macaulay. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily recommend the introduction by Hugh Trevor Roper. I don't necessarily recommend anything by Hugh Trevor Roper. Uh, but you could find this, I'm sure, as a free download from Project Gutenberg or any other such site. I'm sure if you dug around, you could. There won't be any high demand for it, but I'm sure it will be out there. Uh, so that's your penguin for today. It's the History of England by, by, by Lord Macaulay. I've written about at great length. I will, if again, I will try to remember to find and reformat and clean up any writing that I've done on him so I can append it down below for those of you who might want to do your that, that reading. I, quite a few of you have done me the great compliment of telling me that you do like to read the prose that I've written on these subjects. A few of you have even said that the reason why is not to supplement what I say in these videos, but because you actually enjoy my writing. I never hear that. Never. Never. 
Not from editors, not from fellow critics, not from old friends, never. I never hear that. Old friends will point out, oh, you, you zinged this author, or oh, I, I noticed you noticed the, you paid attention to this book. I hadn't thought of that, now I will. Or, or editors will say, boy, oh boy, right on the word count, right on time, thank you very much, very useful, I'll take it. Check is in the mail, all that sort of thing. But almost nobody ever says, boy, that was well written. And sometimes Steve's like to hear that. Despite the fact that I write at lightning speed, I don't do it carelessly. So if I can find any of the writing that I've done on Thomas Macaulay, on Lord, Lord Macaulay, I will append it down below. But in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. This was a uh, bridge too far as far as Penguin Classics go, but I thought I had to give it a try. Imagine recommending Thomas, uh, Lord Macaulay in 2020 on book two. <laughs> but anyway, I'll be back tomorrow. I had no idea that this was coming, so no idea what's coming tomorrow, but we will forge ahead. <laughs> Thank you, book two.